All right, everyone. Good evening. Six o'clock is six o'clock. And uh, I do believe we are there. We are live on YouTube. So everybody, thanks for going live. Thanks for coming together. Uh, this will be the, the final series of Creating Wealth in Real Estate for this year. Uh, however, look for more of these probably monthly events uh, coming up. So just wanted to say thank you for that. Look for that calendar. We'll be shooting out on YouTube as well. Uh, this is a Creating Wealth in Real Estate series. What was the intention of this? How did we even get here? Um, with the market on the run up, everyone wants to be an investor because it sounds sexy and everybody can get a loan and it sounds great. And then on the run down, everybody thinks we're all going to die and it's the end of the real estate world as we know it. And suddenly we all got to start over e yet in these moments, everybody breathe in that opportunity right? Markets, market prices have already fallen 12 to 15%, depending on what city you're living in. And that still hasn't brought you back to 2020 pricing yet, let alone 2019 pricing, which we all loved. So with the ability to go, uh, when we talk about interest rate buy downs, right, with the ability to help lower your payments and prices falling, uh, if you are thinking about creating wealth in real estate, this is a fantastic time to start that process. Now, when people panic, right? We always talk about the, the syndrome, the fight or flight, but usually people freeze before they decide to fight or flight. And when the rest of the world freezes, ladies and gentlemen, I will say run a hundred miles an hour right into opportunity. Um, during 2008, a lot of multimillionaires were made who ran headfirst into the real estate opportunity. So, so let's start being preparing ourselves for that. The reason this particular uh, session is so important is because I think it's the one, look, you have an expert in mortgages, Cole Strain on the call. You got an expert in property management, Tracy Audison. You have an expert in protecting your assets, uh, Marilyn Sparks with Farmers. You have an okay realtor on the call. But when we get asked these questions, which is, how does this affect my taxes? Hey, should I take it in a corporation name? Hey, should I do that? I don't know, right? But I do who I, I know who knows. That's Miss <laughs> Sue. Uh, and so creating wealth in real estate, it, it requires a bunch of things. One of the most critical, I would say, is how to properly manage your debt and what does that look like going into tax strategies. But now, even maybe before you've even bought your first rental, um, how do you prepare your taxes to get you into that? And then maybe you already have a portfolio of four, ten, or forty rental properties, what are the tax advantages and, and tax strategies for that? So I think I've burnt about two minutes of perfectly good oxygen. Um, that should be at, getting everybody to start jumping on the live, which I like, so thank you. Uh, here's what we'd like to do. Go around the horn and uh, introduce yourself, who you are, what you do, why you do it, and why you think uh, creating wealth in real estate is an important thing to do. Uh, we'll go Brady Bunch style, top right. We'll go Cole Strange, uh, Tracy, we'll skip Suhey. Uh, go to Maryland, uh, me, and then Suhey, I'll introduce you and let you ride. Except Cole, you had to And hopefully whoever is um, streaming the YouTube, their Brady Bunch is set up the same way that yours is, because I'm on the bottom right on my screen. <laughs> um, but um, for those of you that don't know me, uh, my name is Cole Strange. I work with Movement Mortgage, um, and I'm really excited about this class because um it's something that's not taught i think to um anybody when they're growing up is children and unless your parents do this appropriately um you're not taught it either um you see debt utilized for a lot of different reasons um and oftentimes it's not utilized for the right reasons whether it's taking a cash out refinance to go on a vacation or buy a boat or whatever it may be um, versus, you know, appropriately structuring things, maybe doing a debt consolidation or whatever it may be. So um, there's right ways to do this. There's wrong ways to do this. Um, and so I'm very excited to hear what Suhei has to say. Thank you, Cole. Miss Tracy, you're up. All right. Um, as Brian said, I uh, my name is Tracy Audison, and uh, I'm with Audison and Company. We are a full service residential property management company. Um, we have over 20 years of experience. We are located in downtown Glendora, but uh, serve properties from Yucaipa to Pasadena, 
um, everything in between that area and then into Orange County in the high yeah. desert. My name is Tracy. Um, yeah, Jonathan. I mean, I'm, I'm excited and, uh, to be on a call with company, all of you, great service, professionals. Residential um, property management we personalize your service, um, uh, whether your property is a single family, um, duplex, small downtown. apartment building. Um, but I think my biggest thing um, I've been doing this for a long time. It's it's important to work with professionals who know what they're doing. Um, like Ryan said earlier, I always go back to check with your tax provider. Like I, we can't ask or answer all of those questions you have. Um, and I can't tell you how many times I, you know, get a client who comes to me with um, trying to rent out their property and they had an agent who sold them a property for an investment property and the numbers just don't make sense. So um yeah happy to answer any questions at the end and i too am looking forward to all of the knowledge that suhey has to uh, share with us this evening thanks tracy miss marilyn sparks it sorry marilyn yep big red button at the bottom there you How go about now beautiful awesome thank you Technology is not always my friend. Uh, Marilyn Sparks with Farmers Insurance. I help uh, individuals, families, and small businesses protect the things and people that matter to them most. Simple as auto and home insurance, recreational vehicles, um, landlord properties, renters insurance, commercial, general liability, uh, workers comp. We. I don't want to say we do it all. We do most of it and we do it well. Um, me and my team help you, or is it my team and I? Hmm. My team and I uh, will customize a protection just for you. I'm so glad to be uh, part of this group. And I look forward, uh, even though I've heard Suhei speak many times, every time I listen to her, I learn something new. So thank you, Suhei, for joining us tonight. Yeah, I, I would agree. I think that Suhei is, it's interesting when you, you hear people talk about stuff, right? It doesn't matter the topic. Um, and then you hear somebody talk about it who's passionate uh, and or knowledgeable, right? Because sometimes extreme knowledge and passion don't collide. So you get this really dry topic about something. Um, but it's great when you can hear uh, education, knowledge, experience collide with passion. And that's what we get with Suhei. So my name is Ryan Audison. I'm the broker of Capital and Influence Real Estate. We are a technology-based and an agent-enhanced brokerage. What does that mean? It means we got technology that allows us to protect you and your data. It allows us to leverage it so you can uh, feel free to move out of California and we can help you out that way as well by looking at asset valuations and other properties out. If you wanna stay in and build your real estate portfolio in California, how do we help you do that with technology as well? Market reports, asset valuations, consultations like this that meet your schedule. Um, and, and I love real estate. So maybe in education, I could talk here and be dry, but I think I'm pretty passionate about it. So I could carry some hours over here as well. Um, and that's why tonight is so important. Um, I think that we don't, um, Cole hit the nail on the head. It's not taught. There's not an educational class for taxes or how to balance a checkbook. There's nothing that says, hey, look, I'm all about paying the federal government as little as possible. Let's just get that on the record, right? Um, and I know that there are legal ways to do that, but if you, there are times in your life where you want to amass wealth and create wealth, then there's proper strategies in the proper way uh, to go about doing that. So without further ado, Suhei with prominence, uh, is in she's a wizard forget the fact that she's a cpa she's an enrolled agent with the irs which means if she messes up and the irs comes for you she actually can stand in court and defend her work and you which is critical and and that's a big deal i don't think she sells that enough i don't think she talks about it enough in her humility um but when you have somebody either just doing your taxes like marilyn said just insuring your car we minimize things that actually matter to us quite a bit uh, and so to have somebody who has the knowledge and understanding, they're willing to put their, 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 uh, look, man, they're, they're willing to put their butt where their mouth is, right? They're willing to say, Hey, I'll go defend myself to the federal government for you. Uh, and then she says, Hey, I also have a passion for helping people create wealth through real estate because she is a rental property owner as well. And so without further ado, believe it or not, I will stop talking. Miss Suhey, take it away. The floor is yours, wherever you want to drive this bus. Get after it. We are excited to have you. 
Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Um, my name is Suhei Piedra with uh, Prominence Business. I am an enrolled agent. I am not a CPA. I'm an accountant and an enrolled agent, which is federally licensed in the United States to do taxes across the United States, right? So um, my main focus is taxes. Prominence Business is located in Glendora, but we do help clients. We do have clients in different states. Um, I love real estate in many different ways, but because I've seen what happens when we have uh, a, a real estate portfolio. Um, and we saw, we all saw and experienced what happened in 2008 and it was pretty crazy, right? So I have over 20 years of experience in taxes and um, I got to watch people come in with shame, with hurt, with, you know, just, wanting help and not knowing who to go to to get the help. So um, when I realized that um, it was um, it was time to educate people, because like Cole said, this is not taught. And people were learning this through life, a, a real life event. So it was hard to see people's credit messed up, not being able to get a rental property, because at that point, for Tracy, if I'm not correct, it was really based on your credit. And when your house is being um, foreclosed on or your cars were being repoed, um, it was affecting your credit. So a lot of these people, it wasn't about how much money they were making. It was about, you know, their, their finances, their credit. And so um, I, you know, I had a client come in making about $75,000 to do his taxes and a custodian at a public school and um, he comes in and is all excited because he's buying properties that are on sale. He was so happy. And I'm like, wait a minute, you make $75,000. How are you buying all of these properties, right? But what did he do? He had good credit. He had, he had the ability to, um, you know, refinance and pull equity of, you know, some properties that, you know, property that he had before. Um, he had some savings and was able to go out and buy at really low prices his new rental properties. And he started to build an amazing real estate portfolio and not have to pay tax on it. So that was even the greatest, you know, a really great uh, part of it was that he was making money and it was all tax free. So I started to realize that we all focus on the wrong number. We focus on how much taxes we're paying instead of focusing how much money can we buy when we have purchasing power. So when you come in to do my your taxes, I will talk about your goals. We'll talk about what is it that you're trying to do. Um, I know that most of them will say, well, I don't want to pay taxes. Well, if you don't pay taxes and you write off what people say, the kitchen sink, right? You may leave my office super happy because you got to write everything off and you're at a loss or God knows what, right? But then you cross the street and you go meet with Cole and Cole will be like, well, uh, yeah, you can't qualify for a loan because it shows here that your business is at a loss um, or, you know, something along those lines. And then you, and then Cole will be like, well, your taxes reflect this. Mm -hmm. Then you come back to me all mad because you can't buy the house of your dreams. Right? So again, the fact that you didn't pay taxes disqualified you for you to qualify for the house of your dreams or the next investment, um, you know, your business building, a business loan. So it really does hurt you. Um, what we recommend is that we strategize, that you meet with your tax professional more than once a year so that if there is a plan of you, um, you know, having a tax liability at the end of the year, that it's not a shocker, right? That you know, hey, this year I'm going to owe, you know, X amount of money because I'm trying to, um, you know, report all this income and watch my expenses, not take accelerated you know, expenses or depreciation or anything like that, it's going to result in you having a higher tax bill, that that bill is known ahead of time so you can plan so that um, you could make estimated tax payments and that that liability is covered because, I, I mean, Cole, I don't know if it's still the case, but I believe in some cases the lender will ask that you pay your IRS liability if you have one in that current year. So, that takes from what you thought would be available for a down payment or you thought that would be available for, um, you know, for, for you to use and invest. 
So all of those things are very important conversations that you need to have with your team, with your lender, your real estate agent, your tax professional, so that we all, um, yeah, so that we all, uh, you know, make the right moves and they all benefit you. So um, I've seen what happened in 2008, but I also saw like how you can grow from it and create this amazing wealth. Um, but when I realize that every client that walks in through the door and when I bring up these conversations, no one is having those conversations with them. Um, it's foreign, it's new. A lot of the times I'll tell you that your homework, the first thing you gotta do is read Rich Dad, Poor Dad, right? Because it's a simple story, but yet it's a, a lot of really good um, tips are given in that book. Um, that will get us going in that path of learning to build wealth through real estate. Um, but I mean, Ryan, I don't know what other uh, objectives you have or, you know, opportunities sometimes you see out there that, you know, tax implications, uh, you know, the taxes become an, an issue yeah, it's, that you would want me to address. It, it's a good question. I think, so two, let's go. Let's go twofold. I'll start with the acquisition side versus the final disposition, right? Whether they sell it and we talk 1031s or how do, how do they realize their, their taxes, they got to pay off the profits. Um, and really, how do we set somebody up from success in the beginning? So a question I get asked a bunch is, hey, I think I'm ready for my first rental property. Look, I'm, I'm going to be honest with you right now. If you're a, if you're a homeowner, and I'm telling you the market is still, you still have 15% equity from 2019, right? That's real. There's still an opportunity if you haven't refinanced with coal to get a HELOC, pull some money out and be ready to strike when the market drops. Uh, if it continues and we start getting back to 15 and 16 numbers, those are still healthy numbers, but compared to what you're used to, instead of a three or 4% return, you might be sitting on an eight or a nine, right? So going into this market now, you wanna prepare yourself, get a little liquid, start building up those, because we just don't know where the new floor is gonna be. And when we start having these conversations, the first question I get asked is this, do I need to put it in an LLC? How do I do this where I don't pay taxes? That's always the first, how's it gonna, is the income from my rental property gonna throw me into a higher tax bracket? And is it better to structure it inside of an LLC? So if you could start with one or two or both or however you wanna do that, that'd be great. So just to throw the LLC thing out the window, okay? An LLC is really not gonna change the way things are taxed, okay? An LLC, I'm not an attorney, I always like to state that. An LLC is for legal purposes when it comes to real estate, okay? It's to protect your assets. It's It has nothing to do with um, the tax world, okay? An LLC is still, we're still gonna report the income, we're still gonna report the expenses, any profit that's left is going to be rolled into your personal return and it's going to be taxed okay or if there are losses they're still going to be limited to uh your income um there's a lot of a lot of other things that come into play whether you can take those deductions on your personal return or not okay so the llc thing has to do with asset protection okay um taxes remain the same now um, with acquisition. Okay. So let's say that, you know, you buy properties and you're looking at, um, at the prices nowadays. I still have clients waiting since, I don't know, 2010, waiting for the market to drop. You know, we've watched the market continue to go up, continue to go up and you miss, it's like the stock market. You just never know. You're going to miss the wave by sitting in the sidelines. You have to decide what is your goal. If these are rental properties, are these rental properties going to be long term? Are these rental properties going to help you prepare for retirement? Are they going to help you pay for, uh, you know, college tuition? Are they going to help you pay for? Are these going to be inheritance passed down to your children? What's the purpose of these real estate properties? Okay, that's the first thing I ask, because real estate properties can be held long term, and as long as the tenant is paying for the mortgage. I'm happy because I'm still working. Do you know what I mean? I still have my W-2 job, so I really don't care if there's cash flow in those properties, okay? Um, some people say, no, I want cash flow. I want it to make at least enough X to pay my car payment or whatever, 
Well, then that's where the numbers matter because you want to make sure that this property is at least leaving so much money on the table for you to use the extra proceeds for whatever. Okay. So goals, what are the goals for this property are very important. Most of the time I get people in here freaked out because they just bought a rental and they're going to have this cash flow and they think they're going to have all these taxes. Well, they forget the beauty of depreciation. Okay. Depreciation is the IRS allows you to write off the, the, the value of the building over 27 and a half years. So let's just assume you buy a property for 700,000 and depreciation is on the building of 500,000. Well, that's like $12,000 of depreciation that you get on your return. Okay. Um, which means that the first $12,000 that you earn on that property are tax free. So again, I got to look at the numbers to give you better estimates, but it's not always a bad deal and think, oh my gosh, taxes are coming after me. Okay. Um, so proper planning is always very important. Um, when you dispose of the property, you have to recapture depreciation. We got to add things. We got to do this and that. But again, proper planning will, will allow us to say, hey, is this a good property for you to do a 1031 exchange on? Is this a good property for you to sell, you know, and replace it with, you know, maybe a, a business building, a commercial building, multiple residences? Or do we want to keep them all in California? Do we want to expand to different states? So um, I can't emphasize that enough. It requires planning. When people just act, Uncle Sam wins. Without mm. proper planning, mm. Uncle Sam tends to win. And I believe that's one of the main reasons why this stuff is not talked about enough or taught is because, you know, we make mistakes and it usually benefits Uncle Sam. So, all right, I almost started talking without unmuting myself there. So I believe it or not, I think that's probably a simple conversation for you. And there was probably another two hours worth of meat just on that because it's not talked about enough, right? right. Um, I don't want to squirrel down the cash, uh, down the depreciation just yet, but I'm going to throw a softball to Tracy because Tracy, I got to imagine you get this as well. Um, hey, I, I want to buy a rental property or I'm in escrow to buy a rental property. What are some of the common things that you get asked as a property manager? Um, because I just think acquisitions, right? I try to drive the price down. I try to increase cash flow. There's things that I do. But for you as a property manager, how many questions do you get asked about either taxes, needing a CPA? What, what does that look like from your perspective? Yeah, so I, I always, the goal is for people to ask these questions before they purchase the property. It doesn't always happen that way, which is unfortunate. Um, but a big question is, um, have it sounds simple, I know people. Have you even ran comps? How much rent can you get for this property? Um, There's so many times where they're like, oh, I saw a sign down the street and you know my mortgage is this and this is what my payment is. Like, woohoo, now I'm a landlord. Um, and I just think there's so much other stuff that needs to be considered. Um, and I would say one of the biggest things is um, having a vacancy factor, um, so many, Realtors or, you know, homeowners when they're purchasing or thinking about turning a property into a rental, don't think about a vacancy factor. Um, and if you don't know what that is, like if your property goes vacant um, and it's sitting there, you don't have that income. So having a little nest egg um, as well as a maintenance account. If you're putting a little bit of money every month into an account, it kind of saves you up for those rainy days when you have a busted pipe or, um, you know, something like that happens. But, you know, we, I've had clients that buy the property and all of a sudden life happens and a tree root goes around a pipe and it's busted and they're like, I don't have money to fix this. Um, so I think really just understanding what they're getting into um, and not just, hey, this is my mortgage. This is what I can rent it for. And wow, this makes sense. It's funny. This is my Sharpie. I'm taking notes as you're talking on my whiteboard, right? <laughs> or not, I guess not my Sharpie, but um, it, when, uh, as soon as Tracy said, vacancy factor in a maintenance account, immediately I even went to, oh great, now they're gonna have to pay taxes on that money, <laughs> right? But you're saying depreciation, and especially over the last seven years, the market has dictated that from a from a apartment building perspective or a commercial investment, we call it a cap rate, right? Cap rates have been compressed for over a decade. 
Um, and so pro what does that mean? That means profits are real tight. They're real small. So if, we're, if we get massive amounts of depreciation, I mean, most of the profits people have probably been turning haven't even affected their taxes. Correct. See, I can sling that in from a sales perspective all day long. Yeah. Great information. Cole, part of this um, I'm going to throw into you is when we talk about proper debt management and tax strategies, right? What does somebody do now? L let me tell you what I mean. They still got equity. They get somebody like me getting them all excited. You still got equity. Let's look at something. Let's get a little money out. Let's HELOC it. Let's pull that 100000 out. Let's go out of state. Let's wait for the market to drop another 10%. It, how do you approach debt debt management and how do you approach that with taxes? So I'm a little bit more conservative, I think, than um, most lenders because I've probably in my entire career probably done like half a dozen cash out refinances for people because I'm always talking them out of doing that um, for the sake of not repeating the cycle. Um, and what I mean by that is oftentimes um, on a cash out refinance, you'll see somebody take out equity on their house because they're buried in debt. They've got credit cards, they've got a car, um, they've got a boat, you know, they've got um, IRS tax liens that they owe. Um, and so in order to um, improve their cash flow, let's say the total monthly payments on that are 1500 bucks. Oftentimes you can do a cash out refinance, pay off that debt, and then maybe only your mortgage payment goes up by 500 bucks or 750 bucks. Um, so you improve the cash flow, you consolidate the debt. Um, I do always try and make that like the last option just because um, old habits die hard um, and it's not uncommon from talking to peers um, that when they do that, three, four, five years later, they're coming back to the loan officer in the exact same situation and um, the same amount of debt. Um, and at some point that cycle kind of repeats, repeats, repeats. And then at some point there's no more equity left in the house. You know, um, we've seen a lot of that happen over the past three years. Home values have been going up, um, rates were low. So a lot of people are doing cash out refinances. Uh, but you know, what have we seen what did you talk about just the beginning of the call on values are down. So at some point you do a maximum cash out refinance, your home value goes down and now you have no equity or you're even worse. You're upside down on your house. Um, but these can be done the right way. Um, whenever I do a cash out refinance, um, I make a client promise me that um, they're going to cut their credit cards and um, not, know bury themselves in debt again um and everybody gets to make their own decisions right like i don't have the um you know I i'm i'm not perfect when it comes to this kind of stuff i know that i'm oftentimes overly conservative but at least not um getting yourself back into trouble um so um that's one thing that can be done um right now what's very popular our home equity line of credit um, and the reason for that is most people that bought a house over the past, you know, um, eliminate the past year. Um, and anybody who bought in 2021, 2020, uh, they've got an interest rate that starts with a three or even a two. Um, and they don't want to refinance because they're now their rate would start with a five. Um, and so what's becoming more and more popular are those equity home equity line of credit they've typically got higher interest rates than a regular mortgage, which would mean now they're probably in the eight, nine, 10% range, depending on your credit score. But you can do that, take out a home equity line of credit for 50 grand um, and utilize that to consolidate your debt. Um, and then as far as the tax related stuff goes, I do always you know, tell the client, hey, talk to your tax professional. I do know what we've started to see more and more, um, and at least um, has brought up the question is when interest rates are low, there's not as much interest that's being paid. Um, as interest rates have gone up more and more, um, I do know that you have a mortgage interest deduction on, I think it's the first $750,000 that you owe. And that used to be, you know, not a ton, um, particularly, um, you know, with the standard deduction going up, but um, with rates up as high as they are, I know that that's putting people into a situation where they 
are going to itemize because their mortgage interest has gone up because now rates are seven percent. Um, so hopefully that that answered your question a little bit. It did. So thank you. I was copiously or taking copious notes. Hey, Sue, hey, let me ask, what is it like when you deal with a lender? I'm pointing up a Cole, but he could be anywhere. Okay. Um, is it helpful, right, when you have a lender that says, hey, I'm actually not going to refinance? Like, I know you do a good job, right? Um, and you, you talk to people with the intent of, I want you to, look, I wear my faith on my sleeve. We want to break generational sin. And some of that generational sin is poverty. And there's a lot of people who just don't know that. And I know you got a heart to help lift people up the right way. How how do you consult somebody and say, hey, we're going to have to pay a little bit in taxes this year, maybe a little bit next year, but don't go pull all this equity out of your house. Pay a little bit more. So you're buying, do you like, tell me what does a normal consultation look like if I come to you and say, hey, I got my kids through college and I got a couple hundred grand in my house and I want to buy a triplex. What do I do? Plain and simple, Ryan, we're focusing on the wrong numbers. Okay, we just are. Okay, we're all trying to save a thousand, two thousand dollars on taxes by, you know, increasing our mortgage interest or not having that mortgage interest because the standard deduction is there. Okay, what about what the the appreciation on this property that it's taken all because I didn't want to refinance it or because, um, you know, I didn't want to pull the equity out on this house. You know, so it's like we've got to look at the big picture. What are you trying to do? Yes, Cole, you're correct. Paying off credit cards and all that stuff is not even going to create a tax deduction because you're not allowed to take um, refi pull that you can take out the equity of your house, but you can't write off the interest on your tax return unless it's used to improve the property. Okay, not mm -hmm. to pay off a car, not to pay off your credit cards. That interest, I have to exclude it from the right the portion you get to write off. Okay. Um, so it's really not even helpful in that sense for tax purposes. Okay. But I tell I what my goal is to tell people is what are we trying to do here? If we're trying to build wealth through the real estate, okay, um, we've got to look at what pieces we have to move in order to achieve that. So typically my clients, because I have these consultations with them and I meet with them more than once a year, there's some sort of accountability in the sense of we're meeting and we're making sure that credit is good. We're making sure that all the ducks line up to where we're headed. Okay. And um, I tell them, so what that your taxes went up by a couple thousand. What's the goal here? The goal here is to acquire this property because it's going to grow, because it's going to create cash flow, because it's the beginning of building an empire. Okay. And so we over, we don't want to focus on the small numbers. Now, Tracy brought up some really good points. Um, people will be hesitant about uh, hiring a property manager. They want to do it themselves. And I'm like, wait a minute, this is a business we're running here. Okay. I don't want, I have an office. I don't want to be the one that cleans it. I don't want to be the one that, you know, make sure everything's stocked. I don't even, if I have paper in this office, we've got people to do that. You know what I'm saying? And when we become our own managers, we don't know what this, uh, what the uh, properties are going for. We're leaving money on the table. And people are like, well, I don't want to be taxed on that money. It's like, really? Is, you know, well, I've got good tenants and, you know, I don't want to lose them. Really? Are those good tenants going to be there when you hit retire and then you don't have money for your medicine? Are they going to be like, I remember you rented to me for 10 years at a discount. Here's a couple hundred dollars for your medicine because you're short this month. It's like, we've got to make, uh, you know, our goals have to line up. If it's to build wealth for retirement and be set for retirement and create cash flow when we're older, then that's what we have to do now to make sure that that's, you know, where that we get there. Forget about taxes. Forget about how much you pay your property managers. They've got a job. They've got a job to put good tenants there. They've got a job to keep, you know, make sure your property is taken care of. And your job is to make sure that we, you know, that you make enough to make Cole happy so that we can go get more properties and we continue to qualify. So it really does take a team to, um, to get our, you know, to get the client there. 
okay? Keeping in contact with Ryan to see what the market is doing, making sure your assets are protected. Marilyn, you know, it's it takes a team to be able to get us to that, that empire that we want to build. But we're all focusing on the little numbers instead of focusing on what we can build. Yeah. You, I want to go back. You said something about um, losses uh, and deductions. So think a high net worth an individual or so or not. Um, what does that look like if somebody buys a rental property that either breaks even or runs at a loss? Is that ever beneficial to somebody and why? So the IRS has um, thresholds. They say, you know, if you make single $75,000, you know, once you exceed 150 as a married couple, you can't take the losses on a rental property. So that sometimes will discourage people. They're like, well, why do I have all these losses if I can't take advantage of them because I make too much, you know? And then I tell them, well, that's okay. What is the goal here? The goal is to create these prop, get these properties today so they continue to appreciate and value and not worry about the cash flow. If you're making too much money, that obviously tells me the extra cash flow of the rental property is not going to break you, okay? You're focusing, again, on the wrong number. Now, there is ways that I could take advantage of those losses today, okay? And that's just called playing the real estate depreciation board. You get some with cash flow, you get some with depreciation losses, and we keep going back and forth. But it takes somebody to help you analyze your taxes and it takes somebody to help you and um, keep you focused, keep you back in line of saying, hey, don't worry that you can't take these losses today. We'll be able to use them when you sell the property. We'll be able to use them to offset other passive income. So opportunities are always there in a tax return. We just have to look for them. Okay, so Cole, I see you popping up that digital hand. So, hey, tell me what, so I'll get to you, but tell me, you said, if there are losses, we might not be able to write them off yet, but when we go to sell it, we can take them off, we can account for them or use them to set aside other, tell me, other passive income. Tell me more. So, so depreciate, or not, losses on a real estate property are not lost. They're banked. So you just have this little bag where every year, whatever you don't use goes in there. Okay. Um, and let's assume that, you know, you sell the property uh, at a profit some a couple years down the road. Um, the, any gain that you have will be offset by those losses that you haven't used all these years that you've been accumulating, okay? So that's a really good thing. Um, but I have clients that say, well, I'm never going to sell this property because the goal is that when I die, my kids get it. Or, you know, I'm going to 1031 exchange it. It's never, you know, I'm never really going to pocket those gains okay so then what do we do with them so then that's when i say okay so we look for investments that are also passive but that generate taxable income and now we use those losses against those profits and they offset each other causing tax-free income so again it just requires a little strategy it requires a little somebody to take the time to really look at your numbers and um and take advantage of them so if i hear you clearly and then call this is probably for me and then i'll hand it up i'll get your question answered is um so somebody's somebody's taking a loss they're making money so they're never writing it off right but they're heavily invested in the market the market was the stock market was crushing it for a while and you're saying, hey, they can take the losses here to offset the, the revenue from, made out of the stock market over here? So those are capital gains and these are passive. And this is passive losses. Perfect. So they're a little different. Yeah, so okay? what, what would clarify as a passive loss? So for example, let's just, uh, a good strategy of mine is let's say we have a California property that you bought and I mentioned that it, half a million of it is getting depreciated and you have a $12,000 loss. You're breaking even, right? You're breaking even. The, the renter pays for the mortgage. There's no cash flow. You're breaking even. You come to my office. We do your taxes. And I add another $12,000 of depreciation to your expenses, giving you a $12,000 loss for the year. What I would say is I would say, okay, now go buy another property, but a cheap building. Let's go out of state and get a cheap building, a property that cash flows. Okay, meaning it's not break even, meaning you're pocketing about 300 bucks, 500 bucks, it doesn't matter, a couple hundred bucks a month in your pocket. 
Okay, let's assume that that profit after depreciation is still $4,000 in your pocket, okay? Well, instead of paying taxes on those $4,000, the $12,000 loss on the California property is gonna offset the gains of that out-of-state cheap building, giving you $4,000 tax-free in your pocket. See, when you're used to saying it all the time, Sue, hey, it flows, right? But mm -hmm. some, well, because I'm saying it and I do it all the time. Yeah. No, I'm no, that, but, at what part you need help in yeah. and then I gear you in that direction. Be, because that, that's a golden nugget right there, right? That's a great right. strategy that says, hey, I'm fine buying out of state. Or when some people say, no, I, I need it here or I inherited it here, right? Mm -hmm. And so, but I need to go out to, to set it off. Um, sometimes a guy like me who's used to eating crayons just need to get spoon fed a little. Cole, sorry, <laughs> brother. Uh, I know you popped that question up. What do you got? Um, yeah, I raised my hand when we started talking about depreciation. And Suhe, I know it's probably not like a super straightforward question. There's probably like some complications that go into it. But since I look at tax returns all the time, I was kind of curious. Um, when a tax preparer puts in depreciation for a rental property, what's that number based off of? And let's just use like, I, you know, somebody buys a house for a million bucks. How much is going to show up for depreciation for that house? Because I know it's not all a million dollars. So uh, um, there's probably, it's probably a vague uh, description with the IRS code, okay? Because it's talking about the building. So what I normally do is um, we go off of, you can go off of the county records that states how much of your of your tax of your property value is building and how much of it is land okay so that's like a legal document you can take to the irs and say this is how i came up with my number okay a big one right now is cost segregations people do get cost segregations where it gives them a report and it indicates how much of it is building how much it is land how much how much of it is your cabinets, your windows, your doors, and all of this stuff. So depreciation will be applied to each single item based on that report. Um, sometimes it's, uh, so we could use, you know, any of those. Sometimes I will, because if it's a new purchase, the appraisal has, the appraiser has just been to that property. So I'll pick up the phone and call the appraiser. And I'll be like, I just saw your appraisal and um, I would like you to just give me something that shows how much of this is actual building, this value that you gave this property is actual building and, this, and then the land. So they will do things like that. And so now I use those numbers on the return to, um, to appoint some of it to depreciate the building and some of it to land. So if I'm understanding what you're saying correctly, um, if somebody is looking to purchase investment um, and really get the max benefit out of depreciation, in a weird way, you don't want to necessarily buy in like the beach, right? Where the land the is land probably the more. Yeah, the majority of it. Whereas you start going out, you know, farther and farther where the land isn't worth very much, but um, the entire okay. value is basically the property. Am I understanding that correctly? In a sense, yes, Cole. But again, think about what's at the beach. Are you going to find a shack at the beach? Typically not, right? You find beautiful, you know, houses with custom things inside. So sometimes the building is worth just as much as the land or maybe more depending on what's in the building. Yeah. So I don't like just to say, um, well, yeah, you have a house in Dana Point, therefore the land is worth more than the property. You know what I mean? It's like, you have to put a little bit more um, thought in it or find more resources available to us to determine how much is building and how much is land. Understood. Thank you. Yeah, you're welcome. Yeah, that's great. M Marilyn, quick question for you. When we talk about setting this up on the acquisition side or, I mean, forget it. Let's just say we stumble across somebody and they're like, hey, I just uh, left with Suhey. I've got a couple of rentals uh, and I'm getting ready to get a few more. Um, why does it matter what kind of insurance they have? Well, it mostly depends on if you want to have claims paid out. So if you have a rental and you have a, a traditional homeowner's policy, which says this is your primary residence, but it's really not, that can be an issue. Yeah. I get many times people saying, 
I'm buying a house. I told the lender it's my primary residence, but it's really going to be a rental. So I need a homeowner policy so I can satisfy the lender. It's like you can't have it both ways. Yeah. yeah. It's either a primary residence or it's not. What's the what's the cost lie, lie to me, ballpark it. What's the cost difference um, between a policy? It's it's pretty much the same because it's based on the reconstruction value. So whether you live in it or you rent it out, the cost to rebuild is the same. What makes a difference is the level of liability. So if you have a rental, but you have a primary residence insurance policy, you're missing out on landlord liability. Yeah. Because it's just categorized as personal liability. And the business liability helps against um, claims for um, you uh, rental discrimination or wrongful eviction. And so what is the cost difference? Not much compared to a lawsuit. Yeah. And, and so, 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 hey, I saw you pop up your hand, Cole. No, okay, Max, I'm going to ask her a question quicker than yours. Don't get mad, man. But I think, I think this does go, uh, Tracy, I mean, I think the insurance thing, Marilyn, that's what I don't think people understand. So, hey, you did a good job about tying the team back together is they'll come to Tracy, right? So they lie to Cole, right? Greasy uh -huh. realtors like me tell them, go lie to your lender, get it, get them in there, right? Obviously I'm being sarcastic. I'm not that greasy lender, but, or the greasy realtor, but they're out there and they're like, Hey, just go lie to the guy. It doesn't matter. Get the loan, get uh -huh. the cheapest insurance policy as possible and don't hire a property manager. And then when they do hire a property manager and the tenant either wrecks the house or they're like, Hey, the water heater is overflowing. Um, and then we find out the hard way, oopsie, we don't have the right coverage. Sui, I'm gonna ask a softball question if you can answer. I mean, it is, a, I already know the answer, but all of that's a write-off. Well, As if an it's expense. your primary residence, it is not a write-off. No, no, uh, the, the the insurance on the rental properties. That's the a line item expense. The insurance on the rental property is a write-off. Right. But again, if you're declaring this is your primary residence and a disaster happens. That's right. Um, yeah, it, you don't get to write it off. It's yeah, only no, for, for the for the internet world out there, we're not condoning fraud in the real estate <laughs> industry. Well, right, that that's not what we're doing. Um, but no, for, for real though, I mean, I guess that goes back to the I'm gonna. So many people are afraid to get into this business and will never create real wealth because they think all these things are gonna cost too much, or I'm gonna have the profits like we already talked about. And as you start to look at the actual list of legitimate expenses you get to write off, forget the fact the depreciation right out of the gate, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, this property has got to be either cash flowing tremendously right at close of escrow or over time you get there, right? As you, as you buy the mortgage down. So I guess that was an easy answer to say, when you go see Maryland to get insurance on your rental property, get the maximum protection you can possibly get even if it owns eats into your cash flow, it'll help the property manager. You get to write it off anyway. So yes, Ms. Suhey, you had a question. Well, um, back to the LLC thing. Um, you know, uh, I'm not an attorney and I always like to state that because I know that some attorneys have lately been saying, um, you can actually get an umbrella insurance over your properties and you don't need the LLC for that asset protection that it's supposed to be providing for you. Now, it doesn't mean you shouldn't have an LLC. It just means in the meantime, you could use the protection that you're looking for through um, an umbrella insurance and, you, and, and Maryland would be one of the individuals that we would contact for that. Um, an LLC may be able to provide you other benefits. And like I said, the attorney can tell you why they would recommend an LLC, but if there's no real other benefit, an umbrella insurance would do the trick. Are those expensive, Marilyn? No, if we maxed out um, the business liability or the landlord liability on the rental at $1 million, and then added another $1 million umbrella, which would extend to your primary residence, a one rental property, and two cars, 
you're getting an, an additional million dollars that would cover extend liability on all of those things for about 500 bucks a year, provided you wow. don't have any tickets or accidents. Yeah. So two million dollars of coverage. Well worth. And it. going back to the proper loan, Cole, what do people save when they get um, a primary residence loan versus a rental? Is it half a, half a percent? I mean, I know it's going to be different, but if we look at when people are counting pennies because they're not thinking about the dollars, right, Suhey? Mm -hmm. Was that a question to, to me or was that a hypothetical? I'm sorry. <laughs> yes. It was, okay. <laughs> um, yeah, I, think so. people, I think people tend to uh, think that they're pulling a fast one by what in, for the interest rate. Is that what it is? I think right. that's not the only yeah. yeah, the rate, the rates, the rates higher and rates, particularly now on investment properties are terrible, quite frankly, um, you're probably paying two, three, four points. Um, actually, Ryan, you and I had a client, they have great credit score. I think the last time that we practiced it out, they were paying three points to get a 7.625% interest rate. So it's real money. It's, you know, it, it's real money. It's probably yeah. 10, 10, 15, 20 grand. But um when you know somebody sues somebody or whatever that's where it becomes a it's never a problem until it's a problem right. so yeah it's, um, all i heard was that's a write-off so <laughs> <laughs> again depends on who you're asking and what perspective you're looking at it so yeah that's fun know. um what why we're on the interest rate conversation um let, it's closely related is the down payment so cold down payments right now on rentals do you ever get them on a second, not a second, a rental property? Do you ever get it at 20% or below? Or is it always 25 or higher? So investment properties on a single family residence are 15%. Um, on a duplex, um, on a duplex, it's 20. And then on a triplex or fourplex, it's 25%. Um, so yeah, it's, it's a larger down payment and most people like you can do a 15% down payment investment, but, uh, it's, don't want to get too much into the, into the weeds, but the pricing adjustments on the loan are so terrible that although in theory you could do it, your rate is so much higher and the costs are so much more expensive. It just makes sense to put the 20% down at that point. So you can do it with 15, but then you're paying three or four points um you know higher so you might as well just put the extra five percent down towards the equity on your house mm -hmm. there was uh some questions coming in uh and you guys have knocked them all out of the park as they came in right so i'm looking making sure we're getting the right questions answered at the right time um the uh i i had a note oh no cash out that keeps buying it down 27 and a half years okay i think i think we've got them um for the questions that came in i think again i was Taking good notes. Um, Cole, actually, since you got your hand in the air, um, I, I want to make sure we're honoring everybody's time. Those of you guys that clicked in, we said, hey, appreciate you watch, watching. We'll get in and out of here in an hour. Um, Cole, say whatever you're going to say. Ask whatever question you were going to ask. Um, and and then we'll it will start you with sort of wrapping it up. Great. Um, so I'll just start by saying thanks for having me. Um, great class, great information. Sue, hey, I have one more question for you since you're here um, and this has been coming up um, a decent amount. Um, so when you purchase a house with your um, spouse and it's your primary residence, you get the $500,000 capital gains exclusion, right? What happens if they get divorced? Um, what happens to that exclusion? Um, and similarly, if a spouse passes away, what happens with that. So um, I know I'm throwing out a couple of scenarios to you, but I've had a couple of these come up just in the past couple of weeks and I direct them to their tax professional. Um, but what happens with the divorce? What happens if somebody passes away? And then the divorce, if they keep the house. So I'll give you the hypothetical. Say they bought a house for $200,000, um, you know, 25 years ago. Um, and the house is now worth $800,000. Um, they get a divorce, um, husband is coming off of the property, no longer going to own the property at all. And then the wife who keeps the house sells the house in a year for $800,000. What happens? So, um, 
she would only get the two hundred and fifty thousand dollar exclusion. Okay. So there's very strict rules on the um, is it IRC one twenty one exclusion. So it'll tell you, um, and there's a lot of scenarios on there as well because it could happen in many different ways. Like you said, somebody passes away and all this other good stuff. So the rule is you have to live in the house to the last five years, right? So if the wife is the one selling the property, she's the owner. She has to meet that requirement. She has to have lived in that house two to the last five years as her primary residence. So she meets it. So she's going to get 250000 The husband has nothing to do with it anymore. Mm-hmm. So it would just apply to her. So they just lose that other 250 exclusion. Well, basically. he's no longer an owner, right? He's not selling the property. He's not yeah. even going to get hit with any taxes on that. Right. So in a weird way, you almost like would want to sell the house before their divorce so that they could get the uh, exclusion for both of them. Correct. All right. Typically. Now, if somebody passes away, I believe they have one one year or two years after that person passes to sell the property and get the, the get the deceased two hundred and fifty thousand dollar exclusion with the surviving spouse. So it might be one year, but it, that's if it's sold within that one year, then they get the um, the two hundred and fifty thousand dollars for the deceased spouse. So they do get the full five hundred thousand um, dollars mm-hmm. on that one. Okay, um, but yeah, there's there's pretty cool ways of taking advantage of that and uh, doing um, you know other other strategies. But there's the timing is critical because it's two out of the last five years. And it doesn't have to be two consecutive year, uh, you know, years that you lived in the property um, that you can do it. But um, but but there is way to get to get it waived. Um, it's just the rules are pretty clear on that. Okay. That was a great question, by the way, Cole. That was a great question. All right, Thank let's uh, let's start wrapping it up. Uh, let people know, hey, Cole, one final parting shot. Thank you. How do they get a hold of you? That sort of stuff. Um, can get a hold of me by reaching out to me, um, Carrier Pigeon. Um, no, my cell phone is 626-255-5414 or an email is fine, cole.strange at movement.com or on social media, I'm va.guru. Awesome. Love, love that. Miss Tracy, what do you got for us? Am I unmuted? You are. Yes. All right. Perfect. Sorry about that. I couldn't see the button or not. Um, Thank you. Thank you to uh, Suhey for sharing information as well as Cole, Marilyn, and Ryan. Um, It's always great to come together with like-minded people um, and just educate. I love um, being able to educate on whatever topic it is. Um, If you're interested in hiring a property manager, if you're interested in um, purchasing or I, I just say reach out, ask the questions. I'm here to answer questions. Um, Suhey made a good point. I see it weekly from people who have owned rental property for you know, years and years and years and want to pass them down. And they have that same mindset of, I don't want to raise my rents. I have great people. And then something happens where they're like, man, I just realized I could be making a thousand more dollars a month on my rental. Wow. But with California laws, like we can't just all of a sudden bump you up to current rentals. So staying on top of market values um, and protecting your asset is super important. So um, again, I'm happy to answer any questions. Thank you for having me. We are uh, audisonco.com. Um, I don't have all my plugs like Cole does, but I'm easy to find. Passing it over to you, Marilyn. Thank you, Tracy. Uh, everyone on the panel, thank you so much. This has been a pretty cool series in 2022 and looking forward to 2023. Suhey, I always appreciate your wisdom. Uh, and two things that you offer, accounting and accountability. And it's not just about doing people's taxes. You actually help people strategize for future investments, and that's amazing. Um, I'm happy to be a resource. Um, If you just want to see if you're being properly protected or adequately adequately protected, you can find me at transferrisktomaryland.com. Thank you. Fantastic. Uh, Miss Suhey, before I put a little bow on it and get us out of here, final uh, one final tip, one final whatever, uh, or how do people get a hold of you? Stop focusing on the little numbers. Talk to, have a team, and let's, you know, let's together work on getting you where, you know, to creating wealth. 
So um, um, here in Glendora, our, our website is uh, prominencebusiness.com. We have social media. Instagram is prominence. Um, yeah, prominence.services. Um, but easy to find as well. So reach out with any questions. Thank you for having me. Yeah, love that. No, look, there's if you haven't figured out by now, everybody on this webinar likes to talk. Um, and a lot of the public runs from the word consultation or set an appointment or talk to me um, because tragically we've allowed our industry uh, to be soiled, right? We kind of drip realtor everywhere. Nobody really wants to deal with it. And, you know, it's kind of like going to buy a used car, right? You do all your research online so you can kind of get in and get out as fast as possible. Tragically, Cole, that's rolled over into the lending world as well. Um, and, and so I think if you're watching this some point in the future or you're on here now, we just want to give you information. Do we want to do business with you? Of course we do, right? It's how we feed our family and keep these lights on. However, comma, I think more than business, we'd love to earn your trust. And I think even more than that, we just love to give you free information. Um, too, too many times we have, we have, we've seen too many horror stories. Our heart has been hurt too many times, genuinely. Um, and so we want to make sure that we're protecting you up front which is why having this conversation is so critical, especially when you're starting to move into uh, rental properties, right? It's just important. So really look at the people that are on this call. If you're saying, hey, I'm ready to move into buying rental property to create wealth, to break generational poverty, there's five people on this call, right? It's Jim Rohn, Sue kind enough to get me a little book right here on my desk, sent it over, <laughs> quotes from my boy Jim Rohn right there, right? Uh, but my favorite is you're the average of the five people you spend the most time with. And there just happens to be five people on this call. One happens to be a broker. One happens to be a lender. One happens to be an insurance. One happens to be a property manager. And one who's going to help you fight your scary fears of paying taxes. So if you were ever going to look for a group of five people that were going to help you create wealth in real estate, perhaps you only need to go to one spot to get all five of us. You like the way I threw up 10, even though I said five. Um, you can laugh. It's funny. It's a cool thing about video. You can see yourself and go, huh, that was dumb. I'm in five. Um, listen, thank you for your time. Thank you for your energy. We, we exist to help you create wealth. Uh, and so thank you for that. Even if uh, you've watched for the last five minutes or the whole hour, uh, the most important thing that we want you to know today is that you're valued and you're appreciated. So thank you for your time. Panelists, thank you guys for being here. Audience, thank you for participating. And uh, we look forward to seeing you on the next one. Like and subscribe to the YouTube channel. That'll work for me. Uh, my name's Ryan Otteson. You can find me all over the place. But if you want to help me out tonight, you can like the, the YouTube channel, subscribe to it, and you're going to start seeing a couple more videos out uh, once a week on what's happening in the market each week. So thank you.